Accessing library computer data. Out there, there are no saints. Just people. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Continuing our Star Trek run through. We're on Deep Space Nine. We're up to the episode called Return to Grace. It's been a while, Clay. It's been like three days and I can't remember how to say the intro. Anyway, this is episode 14 of season four. First aired on the 5th of February, 1996. Teleplay goes to Hans Beamler. Story goes to Tom Benko and directed by Jonathan West. In this episode, Kira and Gul Dukat chase the Klingon bird of prey that destroyed a Cardassian outpost where Cardassian and Bajoran representatives were holding a conference. It's not a very riveting description. But anyway, Clay, how are you? I'm good. I um I didn't realize how quickly this show was going to turn into the everybody's creeping on Kira show. Yeah, it's happening. Maybe not quickly. It's been happening for a while, but it continues here in the probably the most overt uh, of ways where other people in the show are actually commenting on how much uh, how much ass Kira is getting lately. Apparently, apparently, apparently it's a well-known fact that if you just give her enough spring wine, she'll do whatever you say, <laughs> which is very uh, disturbing. Yep. The uh, Pardon my voice if I sound weird. I'm getting over a bit of a cold. That's, and you're just verklempt by this whole, uh, this whole, this whole Bajoran yes. relationship. Um, let's see here. I think that's it. We're going to go into it. We're going to play, uh, take a break. We're going to play an audio clip. Me and Clay are going to come back and we're going to break down Return to Grace. Look. If it makes you feel better to blame me, go right ahead. No, no, no. I blame no one but myself. I was indiscreet. I compromised myself and have been punished accordingly. If someone under my command had behaved so outrageously, I would do the same thing to him. Besides, I assure you, this is only a temporary setback. Everything I have lost, I will regain. It's only a matter of time. All right, Clay. So the last time we saw Gold Ducat was in the uh, the episode Indiscretion, which we mm-hmm. uh, had um, a guest host on uh, for that one. And that was um, a storyline where Gold Ducat met his daughter, Zayal. And this is pretty much the uh, continuation of that story. We haven't seen him in the meantime. Um, and this is just picking up right where things left off in a kind of interesting way that DS9 is doing its serialization now. But uh, we're dealing with the ramifications of uh, Ducat meeting his daughter, him losing his job. Uh, We learn a lot about Ducat. And very similarly to Indiscretion, this is basically a Ducat episode where Kira is tagging along just to give us some insight into him. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's not really a Kira episode. She's just kind of there to show us what Ducat is thinking. Uh, But what did you think about Return to Grace? I really liked this episode. Um, I thought I thought it was going to play out a little bit differently. <clears throat> I thought that there's a certain point where um, when they first fire on the the bird of prey, where she says, "Oh, uh, shoot him in the belly." It's the weakest point, and he like kind of very slyly shoots her a look. I thought that was a setup for this episode being the whole bird of prey thing being like a big uh, ruse in order for him to get a bunch of info on the Klingons. And then it was going to be like, uh, you know, maybe I just watched the prisoner too much. I assumed at the end it was going to be like a pull the curtain away. No one had been killed. Everybody was fine. Yeah. Um, it was all a scam. And yeah, but now Ducat has the information to get him back on top or whatever. And I'm glad that they didn't do that because what they did do was a lot more interesting. He doesn't even. Um, I'm not sure if you're arguing that he gets back on top at the end. Because oh no no no. Okay. Yeah no he he doesn't, and I think that's part of what I like about it is that he, um, <clears throat> they do kind of go that route where, uh, like I I thought I thought he was being um, uh, shifty with Kira, but he was actually being fairly straightforward with her. This is a common um, thing I have. We've talked about it before. My common. I always feel like I should think Ducat is lying, and he hardly ever right. is lying right. about what he's doing. We've talked about that, yeah, yeah. And uh, but he still gets the info, or the, or you know, he still gets enough stuff where he thinks he'll be back on top. But then, you know, because Politics things are more have interesting, changed. yeah, yeah, because things are more interesting when things don't go according to plan. Uh, politics have changed, and now he is a kind of a, almost a man without a country, which I, I found very interesting, especially because he's 
his whole character is someone who is uh, ride or die with the Cardassian Empire and specifically the idea of, you know, fighting and, and political intrigue and stuff. And now he's just sort of relegated to a, a, a desk job and is sort of a relic of the past, at least right now anyway. Um, and I think that's a really interesting way to handle him. It's a um, it's a very talky episode. Uh, there's yes. a lot of just sort of uh, close-ups of Kira and Dukat's faces. I think that uh, the acting is really top-notch here, uh, particularly with Alemo and Dukat. It's 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 clear that he's sort of swinging for the fences in a lot of the scenes, but he's doing it in a reserved way. It's not going over the top or anything like that, and. The, you know, before I get into what I really like about it, I do sort of wonder about the, um, the choppiness of Dukat's story where he's always in a constantly different position when we get introduced to him again, you know, he goes through a lot of changes job wise over the course of the episodes that he's involved in. And, um, the other aspect of that is that while the resolution of the, um, the Klingon politics at the end where because the Cardassians have been sort of uh, oppressed a little bit by the Klingons, they're not willing to fight back to them. Um, That feels, it's one of those things where we know this has been going on in the background, but I'm still, I don't feel we really see enough of it. Um, Yeah. This is, I think this is pretty much the first time we've seen the Klingons since Way of the Warrior, where at the end of Where the Warrior, they were like, well, the Klingons are here and now they're kind of being annoying assholes because they're just sort of uh, attacking random places and their attempt to protect the Alpha Quadrant from the Dominion. And this is the first time we're checking in on them. And so it makes sense that they're there. They have been there. I kind of feel that maybe this episode belongs a little bit earlier in the season. Um, I don't know how easily you do that because you have to meet Zayal and stuff, but it, it it's one of those things where it's the serialization of DS9 is still learning a little bit how to balance it because I feel that some of the stuff that's popped up here should have been brought up earlier to sort of strengthen it. But I still like the episode. Yeah, I I like the idea of uh, of Ducat always showing up in a different role because I, I assume they do a, a bit of that to keep his uh, to make his appearances a little bit more uh, interesting and 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 surprising. But I I could just I could just see like. This episode, Kira gets the stomach flu, and then she's like puking in the toilet, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> Ducat shows up with a mop, and she's like, Ducat, you're the janitor? And it's like, yes, I, I, you didn't suspect me to be the janitor, but here we are, Kira. Yes, <laughs> his, his very Ducati and voice. Now, just this, deli- door, this door has been locked behind me by accident, <laughs> so now we must discuss our histories <laughs> while you puke and I clean it up. They call this the meat lover's pizza, Kira. <laughs> I, I I changed your order. Mm, too okay. much spring wine, Kira. <laughs> I brought you a two liter of Pepsi in addition to your spring wine, complimentary of Domino's. Um, yeah, let me hold your hair. <laughs> the, I think they do, do do that. The other thing... Never thought I would be holding your hair, did you? <laughs> the, the, the other thing that... Um, I think what they kind of have to do here, and I think it ties into Ducat being shifted around is... Not just to um, change his, or to keep you guessing what's going on with him, but I think that the the series itself, because the Dominion are now the main antagonists, they have to realign what the Cardassians are doing. Because yeah. the Cardassians were set up as the sort of main antagonists. They were the Nazi regime that had been kicked out of the planet, but they were still lingering and they were there in the background, um, sort of pro- uh, hindering the Bajoran progress. Now that Dominion exists and they need to sort of figure out something to do with the Cardassian. So the writing decision was that the uh, the Cardassian homeworld would be sort of occupied by the Klingons. They would, they'll have lost that war against the Klingons and be in a position now where they don't want to fight anymore. The civilian government is in control. Uh, the military is no longer that sort of prominent uh, fascist thing on top of them. And Dukat slides into that where, he, as you're saying, he's a man without a country and they need to sort of refigure uh, reconfigure where he fits into the whole storyline. I'm always surprised by how his thing ends here, where he just kind of flies off in a Klingon starship. That doesn't, that seems very not Star Trek y to me for some reason. Yeah. Like it feels like it's so not of a reset button that it is surprising that the episode wraps up that way for me. I do think some of that stuff, uh, as much as I do like this episode, I think some of it is 
a little bit out there as far as six people on a freighter single-handedly overtaking an entire bird of prey. Uh, it was like much they- more. It was much more uh, horrible in the original version. Originally, Kira and Ducat just beam over to the ship and they take over. They they kill all the Klingons and take over the ship by themselves. This makes a little yeah. bit more sense. The, the well, the second that they beamed over, I was like, "Holy shit! That's that's pretty ballsy." I mean, that's Amy. Amy they, gave me Amy gave me the line of you know for a warrior race, the Klingons get their ass kicked pretty handily. Yeah, yeah. she has a good point. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also like that uh, Ducat seemed to be seemed to have been going to anger management classes or something because every time, at least at the beginning when they're on the ship, he's very, very wordy about how he's feeling and how he apologizes for how he has made other people feel. Yeah, <laughs> he's going around. I have been told amends. that I must make amends for all the things I have done. He is very. Um I noticed that too. Why? Why is he doing that? Is he just? Is it the effect of Zayal? It is on step him? six. <laughs> is it the effect of his daughter, or is there something else going on there? The only thing I could put pin it on was that Zayal has had some kind of an effect on him. Yeah, I. You know, that's it's it's tough. Um, I w- I could say that. I could say, well, you know, I think that's part of what made me think he was trying to pull one over on Kira because it's like, well, you know, this person hates me. I got to try and get on her good side. Uh, first thing I'll do is try open to up. make it seem, yeah, open up, make it seem like I'm a better person, apologize for what I've done. And if that doesn't work, I'll just try to get her drunk. Yeah, yeah. He still does his, um, well, we'll talk about that a little bit more. The, the characterization of Ducat, I think, is something that the show is doing pretty well at this point. Yeah. Um, it's the, I, I guess we could kind of get into that now. Like the, um, the thing that's always interesting when you're doing like narrative storytelling in this way is that the audience is sort of biologically predisposed to something about us as humans where we are predisposed to like the main character of something, even if they're bad people. Yep. Um, you, good writing will obviously make it easier to, to connect to that character. And I think that they do that here. Uh, but Ducat is... Ducat's kind of fascinating because he is not a good person. Uh, there's like, and I, I almost wonder if the episode pushes that enough on you that maybe it takes the audience's uh, sort of understanding of him for granted, where they think that well, he is basically an ex-Nazi uh, concentration camp general. Like, there's mm-hmm. no way that you can forgive him for everything he's done. But he is written in a way that he's never so overtly bad that you dislike him on some level, even if you can't really uh, bring your mind to wrap around the fact that he is not a good person. And I think that they, the most villainous he gets is that he shows a um, he shows a contempt for others and a willingness to destroy people who have kind of wronged him, where he tells that story about the, uh, the up-and-coming gull who I think fucked his wife basically is the the implication. And he, (laughs) instead of trying to get back together or apologize to his wife about how he had wronged her, he is upset. All he says he's been fantasizing about is getting in control and shipping that guy off to an ice prison, basically. Right. Um, Right. And he has a couple moments like that where his vindictiveness is like his worst trait. And it's when he shoots the Klingon ship is the other example, the other big example. But uh, what'd you think about Ducat? And you can either springboard off of that or go in any other direction. If you thought something else. I, excuse me. Yeah. I just really liked him overall. Um, I, I think, yeah, it, it is. It is interesting when they put a character like this in a position. You know, like you're saying that even if they are a horrible person, generally the main character is someone you kind of like. Um, and I f- always find that interesting when that gets pushback because I know uh, a, a lot of times, especially recently, people can push back against that stuff and be like, you know, well, you shouldn't humanize these certain characters in X, Y, and Z. God, excuse me. Um, but I think in this instance, it's very interesting because it 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 takes. I think having him likable enough that you believe that it uh, uh, it can take Kira off guard is is very beneficial to the stories that they tell with him. Because if he was just a straight up murder machine, um, then nothing that he does here would really be believable. Um, the thing that I find 
that I, that I think is the best about him here is that um, he's is, is his depression at not even being worthy enough to kill uh, when the uh, the Klingons you know they shoot at the Klingons and the Klingons are just like I don't know what that was <laughs> yeah, and right. they just fly away <laughs> yeah and like they cut back to him and he's just like visibly annoyed at the fact that not even his the, their enemy thinks he's good enough to kill. Um, and I think that kind of informs what he ends up doing in the rest of the episode when he kind of goes off after them. Because if you, if you think about him, you know, you, you, uh, you likened him to a, uh, uh, concentration camp guard. That's basically, yeah, that's basically all he is. When he talks about, you know, fighting and, and resistance and all this kind of shit, he never did that stuff. Right. He wasn't, he didn't, he never got his hands dirty. He's a shat, he's a from the shadows type of guy. Um, there's no, unless I'm forgetting something, there's nothing to imply that he was ever like out there in the field doing anything. No, the, I mean the most be. we know he was, was just in command of DS9. That's where Tarek Nor when it was before DS9. Uh, but still, the the slave labor uh, labor camp that was the Bajorans were being worked to death. That's you don't get a sense of him being particularly military oriented, but he he's fantasizing about fulfilling that role in a way that. I guess it means. I guess he's actually legitimately feeling that way. It comes across as he's also trying to impress Kira, right? So yeah, yeah. you don't. I don't know how honest he is being about that, or if he really realizes that that's the way to go. But he's certainly uh, uh, stuck on that idea. That's what he wants to be. Yeah, it feels at the end like he's having a bit of a midlife crisis. Yeah, yeah. Because um, yeah, he's the the way that he's so pro revolution now. Um, after being so uh, um, of the system, really, yeah, of the system and sort of take it, taking the temperature of the wind, not the direction of the wind, not the temperature of the wind, uh, taking the direction of the wind and then going whichever the way the wind blows. Uh, this is very different than that, and I think it's a it's a bunch of things compounded on top of the fact that he's you know he's kind of being left behind. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Do they touch back on him? I assume he comes back. He does. But, uh, yeah. Do we do we get any more? Uh, see how he's doing. Like, you, does he show up next time? Like in like Mad Max? Like he's been out there <laughs> in the wasteland fighting. <laughs> he's got Bermuda shorts on and it's just kind of changed. He's he's now uh, serving pina coladas. Now Ducat obviously <laughs> comes back. Um, it is sort of a uh, his future development all kind of springs off of this stuff. Uh, it, it all builds on itself. So I, I don't want to say too much because he is pretty important throughout the entire show. But he's um, this is a changing point for him, a uh, changing point for the Cardassians, I think, is another way to look at it. Just the, the whole uh, people's government that they don't want to fight back. He's going to be a rogue uh, actor doing whatever he wants to do with one ship, uh, fighting behind the lines and all that stuff. Um, his... His, his his characterization continues to be interesting. And Zayal obviously is on DS9 at this point. Uh, so that'll be something that's going forward. But his, the way that they, I, I think if there's a problem with the episode, I think that it, it is one of those ones that has a whole lot of stuff going on in it. And you end up, well, it's kind of an important episode in terms of moving the chess pieces around in and of itself, it doesn't feel particularly cohesive or particularly great of an episode because it's a lot of talk. It's a lot of people stuck yeah. in one room talking to each other. Um, and also the fact that they blow up that, like, the Klingons blow up that uh, diplomatic meeting is seems to be a much bigger deal than they make it. Yeah, well, th that ties in. Like, so we haven't seen any of the Klingon stuff. Do you? W did you even remember about what the Klingons were doing? Or did this episode remind you of what they were doing? Or are you like, oh, yeah, right. They are supposed to be out there sort of flying around and fucking things up. Yeah, I totally forgot. Yeah. Like, <laughs> there was a certain point where I was like, wait, shit. Are the, are the Klingons, they're fighting the Cardassians? So the Cardassians, the Major like, I couldn't, I, I had to kind of, re uh uh realign myself with what exactly was going on yeah because it's because i forgot because it's the the dominion kind of busted everything up so then the klingons decided to, to go to war with cardassia right yeah the klingons are just saying that in order to secure the alpha quadrant they have to sort of be in charge and that involves sort of subjugating the other planets in the right. area so okay. they they conquered cardassia and they're now just sort of um 
it's it's not great logic on the Klingon part, but it sort of makes sense with how they would consider things. Uh, and they they're just sort of in the area of being troublemakers and causing dissent amongst uh, the other races that they're interacting mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I like Ducat in this. I, I really love his performance at the end uh, where he's sort of ranting about the way that things have worked out and, and filled out for him. Uh, we also get introduced to Damar in this episode, who's his sort of right-hand man uh, that gets a lot of close-ups, even though he's not particularly important at this point. Uh, mm-hmm. He'll go on to be a recurring character, so he's a name to remember. Oh, really? Okay. Yep. And, uh, yeah, just the, I guess we can just talk about his sort of off at the end aspect of it. So I find it weird. Did you, did you, you mentioned that you thought it was a little bit strange that he just kind of flies off at the end and goes about his business. But um, what did you, if you thought it was weird, what did you think of what was weird about it? It just, I don't know. It does seem kind of out of character, and I guess I understand. I think I agree with what you said when you said it's it feels kind of un Star Trekky. Um, it doesn't seem like very often they just have characters. Uh, well, unless your unless your last name's Riker, uh, who just sort of fuck off into the ether um, and just sort of go on the attack, never yep. to be seen again, or at least not for a while anyway. Like a total change of what they're doing. As a career, yeah. you know, like a total change of everything that they do for a job is very unusual in Star Trek, and he does it here. He was previously a military commander for the system of the Cardassian Empire, and now he is sort of a rogue uh, terrorist, basically, flying around and right. attacking Klingon ships. What's the... Um, He's a pirate. Gonna ye- I know you're all going to yell at me for this, but what's the name of the group that has all the uh, that Thomas Riker was a part of? The Maquis. The Maquis. How come he doesn't join those guys? Are those guys relegated? Are they relegated to one planet? I forget what their deal is. They are in the uh, the like the neutral zone of Cardassian Federation space, so they're in sort of like a disputed territory. Yeah, man, should join up with those guys. They know. We, next time we'll see him, he'll be wearing a flowery vest, and it will yeah. say that he's he's joined the Maquis <laughs> and is ready to go. Um, let's see here. I mean, it's a it's kind of a tough episode to talk about because not a lot really happens. Was there anything else that you thought was sort of impressive? I was. I in, in a general way watching it, I really enjoyed it. I I guess we can talk about the Kira aspect of it, and that um, his sort of lecherous creepiness towards her. Do you think that that worked, or is that too much here? Because he's trying to win her over, but he's also has to be constantly reminding the audience that he's a bad guy. So the way that they do this is they have him be semi charming, but also a bit over the top and sort of. Um, inappropriate i guess would be the best way Mm -hmm. to describe it what would you think yeah i thought that stuff was a little much um like because i i was i was you know as i said before i i was i was viewing everything he was doing towards her as a way of trying to like get on on her good graces sort of in order to get information at least i thought at the time yeah the return to grace of the uh the title it's not just about his position right um and so I was thinking like, well, this isn't really a great way to get someone to like you. Although I guess he was trying everything where he was kind of doing the uh, um, being nice route. And then he was uh, apparently he reads that uh, that um, what's that that book, the uh, oh, the, player book, the art of the the. The, yeah, the, book. the pick the pickup artist book. Yeah, yeah. pickup artist. Yeah, because then he starts like. Saying like, oh, you're dating that guy, huh? Well, he's just, he's banged everybody. Yep. I, I thought it was impressive that he hadn't banged you, but I guess that's gone now. It's like, I, I got a binder full of women that this guy is, is banged. Yeah. <laughs> like that stuff, I that stuff I was, I thought was, was interesting because it, it, it was very much just like he's, he's, you know, need, he's needling her from every angle trying to, trying to get in there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but then the stuff where he was like, it seemed like he was actively trying to, I don't know. Like I, 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 he. It seemed like he was actively trying to hit on her, which kind of weirded me out. Yep. Um, Do you? So we, we've we've actually talked about. I'm not going to interrupt your point here, but we've we've talked a lot about him. Is his? Is this episode consistent in what Ducat is trying to do, or is it interesting because he's sort of all over the place? And I think that he's. He's kind of a, a weird Star Trek character in that way, especially in this episode, because 
he's realistically sort of all over the place. Like you can't really wrap your hands around what he is trying to do and why he's doing it, even though he says a couple times about what his motivations are. But in terms of a a single focus of a story, it's not really there because he's kind of, he's being impacted by a lot. It's being impacted by his daughter, his loss of his uh, rank, his relationship with Kira, his desire to um, avenge Cardassia, which seems legitimate to me. Like he actually seems to believe that at the same time. So it's a, maybe the fact that the story is so complicated, if not complicated, it's like a lot of threads are being tied together and it doesn't result in a, like a storyline where you can really pin down the narrative in a kind of um, efficient way, but it it, it makes it, it fleshes out Dukat in a way that a lot of Star Trek episodes don't do it. Yeah, I I could see him. You, I could agree with you saying he's a bit all over the place. Um, yeah, his I don't know, but or is that is that by design though? Here is is part of it that he is kind of like doesn't know which way to go with things so he is a little bit all over the place yeah I, and i i'd agree with that i would i would think that if that is the intent and i think that is the intent it's a very um different approach than they've taken where other character stories are usually a very there's a very firm focus on an idea like if you have a warp yeah. episode it's about him and the sword and that other guy like there's a very clear focus about what's going on and ducat is a little bit all over the place. And they probably do it, you know, just because they're like, when we bring him back, we need to have options about what he's going to be doing when he returns. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, he shows up often enough that you got to keep him a little more fluid. Like, like, uh, Garrick is around infrequently enough that you can kind of, you kind of establish what he is and then you just kind of play into that, uh, every time he shows up more or less. Um, but Ducat shows up fairly frequently, so I think you gotta. I think there's only so many times you can go back to the um, uh, trying to be uh, uh, sneaky about things. Well, yeah. Um, so having him a little bit more fluid that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, do, 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 just looking over this quickly, I don't think there's anything else. No, I don't think I, I don't really have anything else. I think it's a, a pretty solid episode. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about before we wrap this one up? Um, I don't think so. Um, no quark. You want to talk? <laughs> yeah, no quark. I was going to say, unless you want to talk about how uh, the Federation phaser rifle seems to be the height of uh, <laughs> sleek weapon design. The way was, that is like, oh, this weapon. So good. It's got 16 phaser settings. <laughs> dual, just, target, dual target selection. I just think of, we went to... Uh, we had to buy a bed recently, a mattress, and mm-hmm. we went into like a, it was like a Bob's or something similar to a Bob's place. And uh, the mattress salesman was like a parody of a salesman. Like, it's like if you, if you wrote the most over the top salesman character into your comedy script, so this would be the guy and he would still be sort of, you'd be like, you need to amp, uh, you need to amp it down a little bit. Um <laughs> He was, it was, it's clearly just the, uh, it's clearly a, a man fueled by cocaine and the love of selling mattresses, who is the person that we ran into doing the oh thing boy. of like bouncing on the mattress while holding a glass of water to show us how it's not spilling <laughs> really, really going all over the top for that thing. Man, that's, that's pretty, you know, I, I appreciate a level of, uh, now does that mean that he really loves selling mattresses or that he hasn't sold a mattress in like six months <laughs> and he's, he works on commission? <laughs> it's probably, but I mean, I, I, there's nothing more off putting to me than an over the top salesman. And I feel it's super obvious. Um, oh, I get off put when people say, can I help you with something? I'm like, no, I'm just looking, leave yeah. me alone. <laughs> I'm not going to buy anything. I have no money. That's right. Yeah, can I can I help you or um, anything along those lines? It's really just the the over the top sales that are so obvious at you. I, I just I can't believe that those can, people continue to be sales, especially this guy who's clearly commission based of the way he was selling these things. Like this guy's not yeah. getting seven dollars an hour to sell mattresses this way. Um, yeah, it's just, you got to get the you got to get the mattress salesman who's like Ricky Roma from Glengarry Glen Ross. It's just like. <laughs> No, why don't you come over here? We'll sit down, we'll talk, have a drink, and then maybe, maybe, maybe we'll talk about mattresses. I happen, <laughs> I happen to know a place where they sell them. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, I need um, I need the Baldwin guys sort of giving them the the what's up and the <laughs> after the hours of the store is closed, telling them about mattresses and stuff. But anyway, to get back to this, um, put the, that coffee down. But also notice that it won't spill if you jump on the mattress when you put it down. <laughs> it's got the it's got the mattress pad. Is it, I'm just I'm just thinking about that guy now. He's trying to sell us like a two hundred dollar mattress cover, and then you go to Amazon and it's like three dollars on Amazon. You know, yeah. it's, it's just that kind yeah. of stuff. It's like I don't want this. Leave me alone. We no, we uh, they they sold us when we we went to get our mattress at uh, Jordan's, I think. Yeah, and uh, they have their whole like sleep lab setup thing there, which and they were uh, the first thing they did was like, well, yeah, why don't you come over and you lay on this thing? We'll see where you know your heaviest parts here of uh, of your you know you'll see like a histogram of where like you know you need the most support, and then we can go from there. And when you do that, it's like, oh my god, there's science behind this. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm gonna buy whatever they tell me to buy. <laughs> I'll they pay were whatever actually, price. I, honestly, though, that guy was actually really good because we were talking about you know X, Y, and Z, and he was like, "No, you don't want that thing. You don't want this thing. You want this one. It's pretty cheap. This is a great mattress. Get that one." And we were like, "Oh, that's very helpful. <laughs> Thank you for not trying to sell us the two thousand uh, dollar water cooled uh, memory foam mattress." Yes, yeah, so we're we're off on mattress talk now. But uh, the older I get, the firmer Welcome the mattress to I enjoy. Mattress talk. Yeah, it's a podcast going places. I used to really like soft mattresses, but now I need I need like cardboard, not cardboard. I need like I need like, like plywood surface on my mattress. I like a nice firm mattress. It's yeah, it's something you can just something you can just like roll off. Like there's no uh, there's no edge. It's just a, a very smooth sort of like no sinkage whatsoever. Good for the back. Something something that reminds you of what you slept on back in the service. You right. Know? Exactly. Yeah. When it was like, are there, could we get more rocks onto this dirt so I can enjoy my night's sleep here? Um, <laughs> the phaser rifle thing was funny. I guess that's based on like a real Cold War comparison between the um, was it be like the Kalishnikov or something? And oh, I was. The- yeah, I was I was wondering if that that actually did pop into my head because I do know at least uh, well, it's the M sixteen and the Soviet yeah, AK forty seven. Yeah, some Vietnam documentary I was watching. They were talking about that where the 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 M sixteen was a was a was a better weapon to a point, but the the AK forty seven was just like an idiot could use it. Yes, and it, it never, never breaks jammed or is anything. the thing about yeah. that. Yeah, it's just, it just constantly works. So the, the American M16 is just a, a finer weapon, but takes a little bit more um, care, I guess. A little bit more right, fickle. Right. Um, yeah, and I think I think Zayal made the correct choice there, going with the Cardassian weapon. It certainly looks cooler, even though they are basically the same thing, just different colors. Oh, uh, that is one thing to talk about, actually. I did like... Um, I did like the scene with her and Kira at the end. With the knife Kira, fight? Yeah, where Kira was kind of seeing that uh, Zyle was, was on track to become like she was and she didn't want that. And, uh, you know, kind of imparting to her or imparting to her that if, if you're going to be at war with someone, you have to like tap into a certain amount of hate that's going to – the only thing you're going to want to do is kill these people. Right. And um, I thought that was I thought that was good. Like I, that's why I can t- I, I I love Kira as a character because she's got all of this stuff that she can tap into, and and she's a good enough person um, that she tries to avoid other people doing the things that she's done. Yeah, yeah, the, and they, they don't get really heavy with that either. It's just kind of no. there for her. It's always a, a prominent part, but it's never really a. Um, it never feels like it's just her her point is to come in and sort of lecture people about stuff like that, which is good. Uh, she feels she feels good. I'm still worried about the relationship angle. She hasn't had a standalone episode that's not relationship based in a very yeah. long time. Yeah, I was wor- I was worried about that too because I was like, yeah, man, it's is she she's just turning into this character that everybody creeps on. Yeah, and yeah, is just like the hot one on the station now. Is that the thing? You know, although I would love to see. Uh, I would love to see like a dating game set up with with her and uh, uh, Chakar, Odo, and um, <laughs> Ducat. And Ducat. That would be, I bet Is that, that do you mean the fun. dating game where they're behind the thing and she asks some questions about like yes. yeah contestant number one? Yes, I think that would be that would be uh, enjoyable to watch. <laughs> there, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, there's certainly a lot of puns you could have about that thing. Was that did that show actually really exist or is that just a parody of a dating show? No, that show existed. It's a good the it? dating game. Yeah. Okay. Is that but wasn't the What's the one I'm thinking of where the uh it's the married couples 
getting asked questions. Oh, yeah. That one is called the wedding game. Is it called is it called the marriage game or something like generic I don't know, probably like that? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, right. match game? No, it's not match game, is it? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not that old. No. That's um that's the 70s, I think right there and we, that that yeah. was not something Speaking that was- of speaking of of getting old, um maybe this will be a non sequitur for the day. Um my girlfriend, my girlfriend was listening to some podcast and uh uh on it, they they were saying that middle age begins at thirty five, and I was like, "What are you talking about? Middle age doesn't begin at thirty five. Well, would, would you say forty? <laughs> Is that your answer? I don't. I don't know. I feel like when I think middle age, I think like yeah, late mid to late forties, early fifties. That's usually where I figure middle age starts. Oh, really? That that yeah, that seems. Well, how, that how seem are you late? defining middle age? I don't know. Just I I, I guess. My definition is from any time that I hear, traditionally, when I remember people mentioning middle-aged people, usually it's like 50. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's... Does that seem too late to you? 50 seems too late. Or is this just me denying the fact that I'm approaching being <laughs> middle-aged? <laughs> um, middle-aged, if someone say, if I say, look at that middle-aged man, I'd probably picture someone around 45. 40, 45, I guess. 50 yeah, is not way off, but um I figure 45 is about where it where it where it really, you know, you hit the groove, I think. Middle aged, I think your kids are like 10. Does that make sense? So that that's not really an age, but it's like I kind of associate it with kids being that old for a person. Okay. okay. Um which would mean that you're having kids in your thirties and then by forty you're you're middle aged. Um yeah. let me see what the actual definition of middle aged is. Middle aged. Middle aged. Oh, the definition is uh, aged forty five to sixty five. Yeah. See, Oxford English Dictionary. And those guys, they know they know what's up. <laughs> and what, well, now we're off on the tangent here. Does anyone know what I think is always so hilarious in the d- dictionary? They give you the pronunciation guide, right? How yep. does anyone know how the fuck you were supposed to read these things and pronounce the word properly? <laughs> this says M I D L space apostrophe A J D. That's it's just it's just it, I don't find it very helpful. Anyway, but that seems a little bit old, and then you it, become a senior citizen at sixty six. I guess that uh, that reminds me of when I was in Scot. I may have already mentioned this in the show. I don't remember when I was in Scotland earlier this year. Um, all of uh, all of the signs, like town signs and stuff, had the name in uh, I guess Gaelic is what it yep. would be, uh, which was impossible to read. But then, um, very conveniently under that, they would also have it in more modern English, yeah. which was only about 35% more helpful because it was uh, a lot of them were just the same word, but with a few more vowels and equally as uh, very difficult to read. Yeah, yeah. No, we went to, last time I was in Britain, we went to Wales briefly and we got off at some like rural train station and there was like a 10 year old kid playing with uh, other 10 year olds in front of us who were like, how do you get here? He responded to me in what I would say was Martian, basically. Like it was, <laughs> that was, there was no, there was no broaching whatever he was trying to tell me. I was, it was incomprehensible. He might've, he might've been a feral child who came down from the hills and was just sort of <laughs> just <laughs> saying nonsense. <laughs> but yeah, that's a, that's Gaelic for you in the Welsh accent. Here's a, uh, a quick list, Clay. I'm going to go through these quickly. You just respond with yes or no or whatever the appropriate thing is, and we'll tell you if you're middle-aged, okay? Just a, oh, okay. I was just saying, is this just like a random list of like least favorite countries? It's, or what it's is this 25 list? signs that you finally hit middle age, okay? Okay. So hit is me. reading your phone difficult because the font is too small? No. Is Has hair started appearing everywhere on your nose, face, and ears? Uh, I don't think so. Do you go to bed by 9 o'clock? Hell no. Are you worrying about your looks? No, I never really had any to begin with, so I don't really worry about them. <laughs> do you hit from the, the white tees instead of the black tees on the golf course? Do I win this automatically <laughs> if I say I don't play golf? <laughs> it, it seems like you're not hitting uh, middle age. Do you experience body aches? Yes. Is your shed or basement your favorite place? No. Do you, be, are, do you think that policemen and teachers and doctors look too young to help you? That one kind of yes. Um, I recently, I recently uh, really had a, a, a an age shock when uh, I changed do- uh, doctors or I got a new the new nurse at the doctor off doctor's office that I go to, 
And the nurse is like, I can't exactly tell how old she is, but she's definitely within, I want to say five years of me. Yep. And that was very strange. I had a, I went to a, uh, I switched primary care and I went to a new female doctor and she, she was, she must've been 25. Like this must be her first, uh, like primary care physician or something. I don't know if she's a resident or whatever the hell it was, but it was, she was too, I felt inappropriate getting a physical problem. Like yeah, it's, it's like right? you're too young and this is not right. Yeah. I need, I need an either an old woman or an old man and that'll be fine. <laughs> uh, continuing with this quickly. Are you obsessed with your health? Yes. Do you look over the top of your glasses? Uh, kind of. Do you enjoy naps? Uh, yeah, but I don't really take them frequently. Do you think you're starting to sound and act like your parents? Yes. Do you realize there are two sides to every story? Yes. Do you find yourself saying what and huh all the time? I'm sorry? (laughs) Do you find it hard to lose weight? Yes. Do you no longer worry what other people think about you? Yeah, for the most part. Are TV and film too racy? No. No. Uh, do you know any of the songs playing on the radio? I do. Is gardening an obsession? No. Have you developed little leaks? I don't know what that <laughs> means. Uh, I'm going to say no. I don't think you have a going problem. I think you have a growing problem. Uh, does everything on your body seem to be heading south? Uh, I mean, isn't it always? Do you groan every time you bend over? Yes. <laughs> Do you prefer an early morning Sunday walk to sleeping in? No. Do you have no idea what young people are talking about? Uh, I'm still on the line with that one, but increasingly, yes. And do you misplace your keys frequently? No, never. All right. So uh, listeners, let us know, is Clay middle-aged based on the results of this scientific poll? Um, I, feel so- like, I feel like this scientific poll is, 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 very, is a, bit, a little stereotypical as to what middle age actually represents. Probably. Because if I've seen television commercials about various drugs I could be taking for various ailments, all of these people have like glorious salt and pepper hair. Yeah. And uh, they seem to be living a very active lifestyle uh, aside from, you know, having a Z quip or something weird well, like that. While living in New York City, being able to get away to like the Rocky Mountains on the weekend and walk through yeah. the, the snowy hills and everything I did, like that. I did inform my girlfriend, though, that if we were in fact middle-aged, that means that we have to buy matching clawfoot bathtubs that we're going to sit in yep, separately. Yep, touch fingers. Yes. <laughs> the, um, I think I feel I have hit middle-aged more, but yeah. um, I guess I'm probably I, just I, in I guess, denial. I guess it is kind of. I guess it is obviously personal. I feel. I feel thirty was kind of a turning point. That's too middle, too early to say it's middle aged, but I do feel that something changes around thirty. Yeah, my my marker has always been um, Homer Simpson's age, and he in the show more often than not is thirty seven, which okay. is really which is really tough uh, when you're coming up in a, within a couple of years of being of being the same age as Homer Simpson. Yeah. Yep. He's been that age for a very, very long time. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, the the other thing is like whenever you, there are a few things that have happened where there's songs that I liked when I was younger and they they reference an age in it. They'll be like, it's like the uh, one that popped in my head would be like Blink-182 is like, you're 21, you know that song? Um, yeah. All the small things or whatever it is. And then when you're younger, when, when that came out, I was like, 21 is so old. And now I'm looking back, I'm like, 21 doesn't know shit about anything. How dare you write that song? You don't know anything about anything. Just keep it to yourself. That's that's the biggest thing for me is I've noticed, uh, man. This is re- we're really turning into old assholes on this podcast. I mean, nobody's going to want to listen to this. No, they'll turn um, it off. I <laughs> I have noticed that the and this has happened along all along the way in life uh, that when you get to a certain age and you look back at the age you had been, like when you say you get to college or like you know late college, when you look back at high school, you go, oh my god, those kid, those are they're children. children. Yeah. And, you know, at the time you're thinking like, oh, the high school kids are like the, the adults. And then you get past that and you're like, oh, my God, do, do not trust these people with anything. Yeah. Um, and the same happens all along the way where I think about college. You look back at college kids now and you're like, oh, my God, these these are children. Yeah. Yeah. How did that? How were we supposed to know what we were supposed to do when we were children like these people? Right. 
the high school How are we supposed are, to know which degree we were supposed to get in and then not use it? <laughs> right, exactly. How are we supposed to know that the global economy would crumble by the time we, we, we had hit middle-aged? <laughs> um, the high school is a weird thing is weird because it's like, I, maybe I'm getting older, but now it's like, you know, when we were younger, it was like, there was the, uh, in high school, it was always like the obsession with like relationships and having like having sex and people having uh, you know, getting oral sex and stuff. And now I look at them like, this what's, is totally- What school were, this what is, school are you going to? <laughs> going to an inner city, inner city public school is what this has uh, led to me. But now I look at, now I look at it and I'm like, I take like the most like social conservative political view. I'm like, we need to shut this down. Like this, yeah. this, this can't possibly be happening. They're, they're five years old. There's no reason for them to be talking and doing I didn't realize things. you were going to the high school from 90210. Or- <laughs> I had the- uh, what was the old? What was the fifty-year-old woman who was playing like a high schooler in that show, Andrea or whatever that character's name? Oh was? yes, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Steve- I will say, I will say, uh, my girlfriend and I do have been watching Riverdale, which is a lot of fun. But there's a certain point where you're like, mm, these children, these seem, these kids seem too young for all the stuff that they're doing in this yeah. show. Yep, too young, too young. Uh, the, the youth is wasted on the young, or so they say. Anyway, we're going to take a break. We're going to play an audio clip. We're going to come back, and we're going to give our final thoughts and read some patron thoughts about Return to Grace. We're not going to talk about more aches and pains and shit that we're having, because we can this, just continue to talk about that. That'll that's what be, Star Trek's about now, right, is that, getting old. That'll be the addendum. That'll be the addendum. They wouldn't listen to me. No one wants to fight. <sighs> There was a time when the mere mention of my race inspired fear. And now, we're a beaten people. Afraid to fight back because we don't want to lose what little is left. It's not the Cardassians I know. What Cardassians? Don't you see, Major? They're paralyzed. They're beaten and defeated. I am the only Cardassian left. And if no one else will stand against the Klingons, I will. All right, Clay. So we went off on a little bit of a tangent there, but people love the podcast because we stay on focus. So let's stay on topic here and we'll sort of rate what we think about these Star Trek episodes. Um, Return well, I to Grace. we were going to just start talking about taxes or something. Right. <laughs> it's not April or January. I like to do my taxes early because I'm middle-aged. Um, let's see here. I'm going to read some patron thoughts. If you guys support the show on patreon.com, you get to leave your thoughts about upcoming episodes and we read them. Um, I put up a new post that you guys can do for the second half of season four. There's only been a couple so far, so um, I'm not saying you have to fill it out. I just wanted to bring it to people's attention that it is up there and feel free to do everything from return to grace to the end of the season. Matthew Ross says, Ducat at vulnerability, but you have to wonder. The fact that the Cardis don't have Q ships or dirty tricks like when they turn the freighter into makes you wonder how come they're as dominant as they are. Kira makes notes uh, of their rigidity in saying how Ducat can be a terrorist. It's also nice that the XO Damar comes into play later. You can tell Kira was actually thinking of joining an irrational not to be part of this new resistance group is also believable. I do like that Ducat points out that's the type of men she likes, and they all seem to uh, to ha- uh, to lack, I think is what you mean, to lack charisma. Zyle's presence lends a nice Achilles heel to Ducat and explains the circumstances of a very regimented system. Kira's presence and actions make it clear she can be deadly in all manner of weapons, including herself when she's not sexing it up. The takedown of Zyle and play fighting always struck me as scarily cold. Her comparison of the rifles is root beerable in their explanation, ex- uh, explanation, enjoyable in a dark way. Neil Brennan says, Return to Grace, DS9 can pretty much do good episodes in its sleep now. Kyle Barrett says, Return to Grace. Unlike other good episodes this season, like Our Man Bashir, I think this episode was absolutely necessary, maybe even needed earlier in the season. Since the Cardassian coup of the season premiere, the show has returned to needed to reevaluate Ducat's role, not only in the series, but in the radically shifting political environment of the Quadrant. The Cardassians are in danger of becoming irrelevant to the show now that the Dominion are the main antagonists. And I like that they're played into that angle in a kind of meta way in the actual episode with Ducat refusing to see his race fall into the background of the galaxy's fight for power. Although I still don't care for Ducat's flirting with Kira. Why does every Kira story now need to have some sort of romantic angle? And that's it. Chloe, did you have anything you wanted to say about any of those comments? I think I pretty much agree with everyone there. Um, No, I fell asleep because I'm old now. (laughs) My jaw is hurting from all this reading, so uh, it'll take some take some pain medication and call it a day. That's it. Thank you guys, patrons, for uh, writing your thoughts. Thank you for leaving your thoughts. 
Much appreciated. And uh, leave some more for the upcoming ones. We've got some good ones coming up. But return to Grace. Clay, what are you going to give this one? And what are your sort of uh, final opinions of it? <clears throat> your thesis um, statement. I think I'm going to give it a four. Uh, I really liked it. I, I, you know, it deals with consequences of actions and, uh, that's my favorite thing in stories. Uh, and I think it gets into the relationship of Kira and Ducat pretty well and does some interesting things and throws some left, left, I don't know, the curveballs. There we go. <laughs> I'm getting old. I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting all the. Uh, it, it, leave, it leaves the. It leaves the left blinker on for a while, even when Clay's, it's not changing Clay's lanes. Podcast cliche Rolodex is uh, is in the repair yeah. shop, so he's he's, <laughs> he's he's just trying to come up with stuff off the top of his head. Um, yeah, no, I think it's. I think it's good. I enjoyed it. Let's see. Uh, I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it a four too. Although I think it's it's a slightly weaker four for me for some reason. Um, I really enjoyed it. I think it's just the smallness of it puts me off it a little bit. Um, that's not really a valid criticism or anything, but it's a it's definitely an episode that's improved because of how much DS9 we've watched prior to this. Yeah. Um, and I like the Ducat angle. I, I, watching it this time has really sort of shown me how unique Ducat's storyline is and that it's a little bit schizophrenic, but it's also, it comes at you from a lot of different angles. Um which is maybe why he's regarded as one of the better villains that the series has ever had. Because yeah, he's, he's not so one he's note. Very, yeah, he's very unpredictable, you know? Yeah, yeah. And again, I still always think he's lying even when he's not lying. It's just some, something about the tone of voice or something there from him. It's just very... Well, uh, every, if you say everything with a little kind of underhanded zip to it, then everything seems like you could be lying. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty good... That's a pretty good Ducat, actually. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see the... Major, are you telling me the truth? That's that's uh, that's not maybe. Are not you sure good. this coffee is decaf? Because <laughs> something very bad will happen to both of us. Do all of it the cargo be, bays need to be emptied? It that's, would be uh, very painful for you. <laughs> Speak of the devil, and he shall appear. Uh, let's see you, here. So, Kira, you you, you saw Venom. The That'll be your non sequitur. So I we're both giving it fours. There. You saw Venom, and you uh, you didn't think it was as bad as people thought. No, I didn't. I um, I I thought it was. I don't know why it's getting shit on so much. I think it's a fun movie. Uh, it doesn't reinvent the genre by any means. Um, but like, I I think the 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 body of the movie is pretty forgettable. But Tom Hardy's great, and the characterization of him and Venom is is a lot of fun. And uh, I think getting all of the origin stuff out of the way will allow them to do some some cool stuff when they inevitably make a sequel because they made like $80 million or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's at records. I don't know what the record would be for that weekend, yeah. but maybe something Yeah, something I think it's like the, the highest opening movie in October or something like that. Okay, or the month. Yeah, maybe that makes sense, which is a little surprising. I guess that's not a peak movie era or anything. But anyway. Well, you know, so I was, I was talking to someone at the comic book store about it last week, and he brought up a good point, which is that um, most – Older comic book fans like myself. Middle-aged think, ones. Middle-aged comic book fans like myself think about Venom in the context of Spider-Man, right? And I, I mean, this whole time I was saying, like, how do you, how the hell do you make a Spider-Man movie with, the, I mean, a Venom movie without Spider-Man in it? Because they are so uh, intimately linked, right? Um, but he mentioned that for most, for a lot of younger people, Venom is a freestanding character that only has like tangential ties to Spider-Man. Um, I, they, I think younger, younger comic book, I only associate Venom with Brock and he's right. had like six different hosts after that. Right. We've all had a lot of time. So I don't yeah. know any of them. And so I, maybe younger readers do think of Venom as only the symbiont. Well, they, they, uh, um, somewhere in like the mid nineties, they shifted him into this because he originally was just a straight up villain. And then I think he got so popular that much like in wrestling, they gave him a face turn and uh, shifted him into this like anti-hero thing yeah, where lethal protector. Yeah. So basically it was like, it's kind it's the relationship you see in the movie more or less where the venom symbiote wants to eat people. And Eddie Brock is like, no, we have to try and we can only eat bad people, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, from that point on, he became, he had his own book. He was, he, he had his own villains. He had his own storylines. And I think 
there's a lot of people who are fans of the character that don't think of him as so closely linked to Spider-Man as, as I do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Although I think those are probably the people that came out in droves to see that movie. Yeah. Although I, the more you get into it, um, like Carnage is obviously in the next movie. So right. the more that you the more that you involve that kind of stuff, the more it seems weird that Spider Man isn't involved in any of it. Yeah. Um I I I wish that he was, but I don't think he's gonna be, unfortunately. No, no. Which is I mean at this point it doesn't make any it does there's no point in having him involved in it. Um, yeah, just gonna show up and do something. Yeah. Because um, the, the the biggest the biggest Influence he has is on the origin of the character, and once they've kind of done that without him, there's really no reason to, to bring him back in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's about it. I think we're done. Thank you guys for listening. All the social media links will be there. There's Facebook, Twitter, blah, 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 Discord. Go there if you want to do some talking. Patreon.com slash The Penske File if you want to support the show there. Rate the show on iTunes. If you have your uh, iPhone out, just go to the podcast app and rate us there. It's the easiest way to do it. I think we're almost at 50 ratings, which is fantastic. That makes me Middle-aged ratings. Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, if you can read the font on your screen and your, your sort of wrinkly thumbs uh, manage to type out a review, it'd be much appreciated. Look for our ad in the AARP magazine. <laughs> oh, actually, I got my first AARP mailing stuff, I oh, think. Oh, So really? maybe, maybe I am middle-aged. I don't know why they, what triggered it to come in, but it did come in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see here. I think we're done. I think that's it. I thought I had one other thing to talk about, but I guess I don't really have anything to talk about. Um, we will be back with Real Ripe and Real Rotten. We'll return at some point. The Star Trek will continue going on. Badass, check that out. Uh, Clay and Sean's Batman the Animated Series podcast is all out. You can check out all the it first It exists. Seasons. It's real. Yeah, it doesn't it go to another school. It's out there. And I don't think there's anything else. Do we have anything else to say? Do you have anything else to say? Uh, I don't think so. Issue two of Poser's out. If you guys want to check that out, you can do that. Yeah. Um, I think that's it. I felt I had something. As soon as we hit stop recording, I'm going to remember what it is. But anyway... We'll fill you in with the uh, the next episode that comes along. Oh, I guess I should. Uh, I guess I will also read the. What is the next episode? Next episode is everyone is screaming it right now. Next episode is Sons of Moog, which is a good wharf episode, I think, Clay. So you'll be uh, happy oh, to see that one. Uh, and thank you, as always, goes to the Captain Tier patrons who get a shout out. It's Stephen Cobb, Jay Stanley, David K, Nick Sergi, Nathan Elliott, Michael Pond, Matthew Cutler, Will Yates, Matt Flores, Samuel Custer, Sanchez Gonzalez, Robert Cummins, Andrew Cherlog, Spinobi, Russ Graham, Eric Johnson, Decker Sebastiani, Neil Brennan, Bradley Killens, Mike Burnett, Matthew Ross, Ben Douglas, Kyle Barrett, Joint Mango, Tark Latif. When Tark finished his uh, DS9 watch through he started with the podcast and is already done with the series oh so uh, yeah man I, I was impressed with his dedication although clay i don't know if you saw his tweet i retweeted it but um it re it, the rewatch reaffirmed his belief that it's his favorite television show of all time so oh wow oh, that's cool we've got more to go we've got more to go sons of moog will be the next one up clay thanks for coming apparently on. he's never seen a little show called charles in charge yeah or little wonder which is yeah. you know up there that it was so that good the they one had to show at 6 a.m in the morning is that the one with the girl who's a robot? Yes, her her father works at like the robotics, <laughs> the robotics industry or something, and yeah. he brings her home. Yeah. yeah that was a good uh, one. Anyway, that's it. Clay, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, guys. We will see you next time.